Thanks, Sam. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome on this beautiful sunny afternoon in, in London, at least anyway. So thanks all of you who've given up some time. Um, and it's great to have this opportunity to share a few thoughts with you on a topic that I hope you'll find interesting. Um, but before that, let me just introduce myself quickly. Uh, so I'm, I'm Mark Hester and I've always been interested in designing and making things and I decided to study industrial design at Brunel University and since graduating in 1996 I've worked in various design consultancies as a model maker and a designer and 10 years ago I founded a company called the Imagination Factory with some friends. I'm married to Claire and have three teenagers who all very patiently put up with whatever the latest crazy idea is that I'm working on. Uh, Claire and I lived in Brazil for four years working with a charity for street children. But apart from that, we've been London based for, for most of our lives. When the coronavirus pandemic hit, I was looking for ways to respond and came across the uh, 3D crowd and also joined in with an organization um, for a hackathon um, to, called the Coronavirus Hackathon to generate ideas for post-COVID-19 solutions. Um, Claire also got involved with 3D Crowd once she found out why I kept disappearing off to the shed to print another headband. Um, and she did a fantastic job running one of the, the, the West London hub and then uh, organizing London overall. So it's been a very busy but rewarding couple of months and a huge privilege to see really how a decentralized response to an emergency can actually have a profound effect. So on to the subject of this talk, what is human centered design and why should you care? Um, well, to, to answer the first part of that question, we should probably take a step back and work out what we mean by design because uh, it's one of those words that can mean many things to many people. So if you've got access to the chat function wherever you're listening to, just um, throw in your thoughts on, on what design means to you. Just kind of throw them out there as if we were in a room all together. And yeah, so quite often when I ask this question, people will say it's how something looks, it's how you make something work, yeah, it's aesthetics, uh, fashion, graphics, 3D design, and, and yeah, it's all of those things. Professor Victor Papanek, whose book you can see here, the author of Design for the Real World, said that design is the planning and patterning of any act toward a desired foreseeable end. So to put that more simply, it's to do with figuring out how to get from where we are now to some kind of improved situation in the future. And the interesting thing about this definition is that it means everyone is a designer. You don't have to be able to draw beautifully or work out complex engineering calculations. When you look in the fridge this evening and figure out how you're gonna make something edible from the random collection of items in there, you've just become a designer. So rewording what Victor Papanek said several decade, decades ago, I'd like to define design as the discipline of generating solutions through the act of making something new. It is a discipline because although in some way or other, everyone is a designer, there is still a subject of design that can be studied in a formal way. It's always focused on solutions because the starting point is some kind of problem or challenge. And it always involves making something new, even though that thing might be a product or service or maybe even a government policy. So if that's our definition of what makes something, of, of, of what design is, what actually makes something human-centered design? Well, that's where the discipline of generating these solutions through the act of making something new is driven by the needs, desires, and context of the people we're designing for. So some of you are probably thinking, well, isn't that how all design is done? Surely people always think about the person they're designing for. Some of you might have heard the fantastic talk earlier uh, with Ed and his team from the Enable project, where they talked about user-centered design and how they involved um, some of the children they were designing prosthetics for in the process. And without a doubt, user-centered design is absolutely vital. But human-centered design also goes a step further. The approach leads you to think beyond the immediately obvious people, and, and, and it helps you to think of a wider landscape of, of the people that might be involved in the system that you're developing. So let me give you a couple of examples that will hopefully show you why this is important, and also the dangers of not applying human-centered design that can affect people and organizations of any size and influence. So in 2007, Pfizer, the large pharmaceutical company, announced it was pulling one of its latest products called Exubra 
despite spending hundreds of millions of dollars developing it. On the face of it, Exubra was a fantastic idea because it enabled people with diabetes to take insulin without needing to inject themselves. The product was based around inhalable insulin and promised the end to the discomfort of needle stick that's associated with multiple daily injections. But after two years and a significant amount of advertising, only 1% of the market had taken up the product and Pfizer was forced to write it off at an estimated cost of $2.8 billion. So what went wrong? Well, I'm sure there were lots of reasons for the product's failure and I'm sure it's been studied at length. But having looked into it, from the point of view of a designer, there's a couple of things that jump out immediately. First of all, if you look at the images uh, online and the image you can see here, it was about the size of a can of tennis balls. And there are some hilarious marketing images that showed someone using it in a restaurant. And trust me when I say it, it looked like a completely different kind of drug delivery device. One of the things that we know from projects we've done with people managing diabetes is that discretion is a major factor. They don't like to call attention to the fact that they need to take insulin regularly. They will often go off to a quiet place when they need to inject. This product just did not allow them the discretion that they needed uh, in order to treat their, their condition. But the second issue is probably even more important than the size of the device, and it's what makes human-centered design slightly different to user-centered design. Currently, people with diabetes will have, have regular checkups with a doctor where the dosage of insulin they're taking is reviewed. If the doctor decides the dose needs to be changed, it's a simple matter of just turning a dial on the injection pen. But with inhalable insulin, it's slightly different because they have to do a lung function test as well. Because if someone's capacity to take the drug by inhalation is changed because of the way their lungs are performing, that will affect the dose. Now we all know how overstretched doctors are and how little time they have for each appointment. And the main route to market for Exubra was through a doctor's prescription. But if this is going to add to their workload, it's not hard to imagine why they wouldn't recommend it over a traditional injection method. A human-centered design approach and this idea of testing early and often with as wide a range of stakeholders as possible would have revealed this problem before any chemical formulation was even made. Moving on from uh, Exubra, uh, depending on the age of the people that are, uh, are listening to this talk right now, some of you might remember this, this man, Sir Clive Sinclair, inventor of the Spectrum computers and a true innovator at the cutting edge of home computing. He was a serial entrepreneur who sold his trademark to Amstrad for five million pounds back in 1986. But he's also remembered as being the brainchild for this, the Sinclair C5 personal electric vehicle. Sir Clive saw the opportunities of a market for a small electric vehicle and believed this is what people wanted. It launched in the January of 1985, but within a year, it was clear that the idea was an unmitigated disaster. Only a fraction of the vehicles they produced had sold, and the company that was set up to retail the C5 was liquidated soon after. There are many theories as to why the C5 was such a lead balloon including a failed marketing strategy, technical problems, and so on. But I want you to do something for me quickly. Wherever you're sitting right now, hold your hands down by your hips. Place them on the seat of your chair or whatever you're resting on. Now look to your right and imagine that you're about the same height as the wheel arch of a car going 30 miles an hour. Now imagine there's a light drizzle in the air, you know that kind of weather you get in November, and your only means of steering and controlling the vehicle you're in is via a handlebar that passes underneath your legs. Let me ask you something. How safe do you feel? If you're anything like me, you can't wait to get out of your imaginary C5 and find the nearest bus stop. My belief is that it wasn't just the technology, technical challenges that killed the C5. It was a fundamental human desire to complete the journey that you set out on in the same condition that you started it. A human-centered design approach could have revealed this issue before a single electric motor was wired up to a battery. But I can imagine some of you are thinking, well, that was the 80s, and surely we've come a long way since then. Organizations have had decades to learn this stuff, and executives are sent on week-long conferences to make sure they launch products that people really want. Well, sticking with the theme of vehicle design, let me ask you a question. When do you think the first female crash test dummy was introduced? The 70s, the 80s, maybe the 90s? 
was 2011. That's right, up until less than 10 years ago, the design of cars did not have to pass any safety tests that considered the specific anatomical requirements of 50% of their users. And in 2018, a study carried out in Sweden discovered that most of the safety regulations required a 50th percentile male dummy to be used to represent female drivers. As a result, it's believed that women involved in car accidents are 47% more likely to suffer a serious injury. Following a similar line of thinking, what about a subject that's close to many of our hearts, PPE for frontline workers? Sadly, it's pretty much the same picture. Products are designed to pass regulations that are often based on a standard male head. A report in 2017 found that only 5% of female frontline workers had found that their work was not hampered by ill-fitting PPE. So a lack of consideration for the humans that we're designing for can lead to a product that fails commercially or a product that is forced on people but fails to meet some of their basic needs. But there's another even broader aspect to the way we design things that deserves to be thought about. And that's the unintended consequences that sometimes occur when we try to solve a problem. Thomas Midgley was a prolific US inventor who worked at General Motors in the early 1900s. In 1921, he discovered that the addition of a certain chemical to petrol prevented the awful knocking sound that was associated with the internal combustion engine at the time. The additive prolonged the life of the engine and enabled further evolutions of the design. 10 years later, he also developed a non-flammable and non-toxic substance that could be used in refrigerators and aerosols and dramatically improved the safety of those products in people's homes. Thomas understandably won several awards for his work. He died before the world discovered that this one man had contributed two of the most polluting substances the earth has ever known. The CFCs he put into refrigerators and aerosols created the hole in the ozone layer that took decades to resolve. A study published in The Lancet in 2018 discovered that one in five deaths in the US have been hastened by exposure to lead in petrol. Now, is it unfair to expect inventors and designers to have the foresight to understand how their innovations might have unintended consequences? Possibly. You don't know what you don't know. But in the case of lead in petrol, it's worth noting that Thomas Midgley went on record to emphatically insist that he was confident it would do no harm. And this was despite the fact that he had just spent the months before recovering from a bout of lead poisoning. It seems that Mr. Midgley didn't really give as much thought to the consequence of his work as he could have done. He sadly died at the age of 51 after contracting polio, but it wasn't really the polio that got him. Instead, he built a contraption of pulleys and ropes to help him get out of bed, and he unfortunately became entangled in them and died of strangulation. Thomas Midgley's story should be a lesson to us all that whenever we set out to solve one problem, there's a high degree of risk that we might cause another. I'm sure I'm not the only one who's been printing headbands for face shields and wondering where all this plastic is going to end up. So hopefully I've convinced you of the importance of considering the needs, desires and contexts of the people that we're designing for, and therefore the importance of human-centered design. But with all this talk of failed products, gender inequality and unintended consequences at a global scale, there must be some good news, right? Well, fortunately there is, because the solution is actually really simple and it can be put into action with relatively little effort. And that's because the key to being a human-centered designer is to develop a particular mindset, which absolutely anyone can do with a little bit of guidance and practice. And on top of the mindset, there are some tools and techniques that can be learned to help, help you apply that mindset in different scenarios. But even these are very easily picked up. So what is the mindset that we need? It begins with humility, the recognition that we're not designing for ourselves or our ego. And then we need empathy, that ability to walk a mile in someone else's shoes. We also need imagination. If we're gonna solve the problems around us, we have to be able to imagine a different future. Einstein said, logic will take you from A to B, but imagination will take you everywhere. And we also need to be willing to collaborate. One of the things that attracted me to 3D Crowd in the first place was the social capital that was in place from the very start and meant that we were all in this together. And the Prusa design of the headband is also a great example of collaboration where the design was done 
in collaboration with the Czech Health Ministry. And next, you need a willingness to iterate. People who like to say the first idea is always the best are missing the point. Sometimes you have to go around the loop with your solutions to make sure that you aren't invoking some of those unintended consequences that we talked about. Also, it's actually rarely true that the first idea is the best, by the way. And finally, we need to adopt an attitude of curiosity. When we're solving a particular problem, it helps to be genuinely curious about the people that we're involved with and why things are being done the way they are today. Margaret Mead, the anthropologist, said, what people say, what people do, and what people say they do are entirely different things. Unless we're curious enough to find out how people really use products and services, we won't know what the real issues are. So we heard some cautionary tales earlier about what can happen when we let our designing be led by the, the latest technology or fail to consider the needs of the broadest landscape of people possible. But there's one other really good reason why we should care about human-centered design. And it has to do with a fairly obvious but often overlooked factor when we're trying to solve various challenges. Any kind of design, whether it's a piece of 3D printed PPE, a new building or a brand new care home service will go through a process from the original concept through to the final launch of the solution. People who will interact with the solution are often consulted towards the end when there's something concrete to show. Maybe there's a focus group or a patient trial or some kind of stakeholder engagement. But as the process of developing a new design progresses from the concept stage through development and finally into release, the relative cost of fixing an issue becomes exponentially greater. As the architect Frank Lloyd Wright used to say, you can fix a mistake on the drawing board with an eraser or on the building site with a sledgehammer. And this is the core reason why innovation of any kind is risky and potentially damagingly expensive for any organization, entrepreneur or individual. So within human-centered design, as within user-centered design, we have this concept of testing ideas and testing aspects of our design often and early. We want to front load the whole process so that we can learn at the point when it's cheapest. Often if I'm working on a design project with a client, I'll suggest that we do some really early rough and ready testing of the concept. But more often than not, the client's worried about talking to the potential users too early. They think that people might not get the idea or that when we show it to them, it won't be well developed enough. They might get a bad impression. But I've noticed an interesting thing when testing ideas with people early. You usually only have some sketches on paper or maybe a card model or some roughly 3, 3D printed object uh, and it doesn't quite work yet. But when you put these things in front of people and ask their opinion, they don't hold back. They don't mind picking up a pencil and scribbling all over your card model or grabbing some blue tack and sticking it on your 3D printed model to show how it could be improved. But later on in the process, when we show someone a nicely finished model or a beautifully rendered photorealistic image, people are much less likely to tell you what they really think. It's basic hum human uh, thinking. No one wants to tell you your baby is ugly. So what can you do now? If you recognize how human-centered design might help you in your work or the voluntary endeavors that you're involved in, start by working on those aspects of the mindset that you need to strengthen. And if you're not sure which areas to focus on, just ask someone who knows you really well. If they understand why you're asking them, they're not going to hold back from pointing out where you lack humility or curiosity or a willingness to collaborate. Next, there are some great resources online where you can find videos and tutorials that will teach you various techniques that you can use uh, that will help you to apply a human-centered design approach. As we come to the end of this talk, I'd like to share one of these techniques which I have found particularly helpful and have used both inside and outside of work. The technique is called Rose Thorn Bud and was originally developed by the American Boy Scouts to help them evaluate how to respond in a situation with unknown outcomes. It's best done with a group of people, but there's no reason why you shouldn't try it out on your own, on your own too. It works by color coding the elements of an existing design, service or system. Pink post-it notes are used for anything that's working well, the roses. Blue ones for anything that's really not working out or is a problem, the thorns. And the green ones for anything that represents some kind of opportunity for improvement, the buds. You give yourself or your group 10 minutes to think as hard as you can about the existing situation. 
and write down one thought per post-it note. By the end of 10 minutes, you'll be amazed how many things you will have written down. And if you're working in a group, this technique works brilliantly because there are always the natural op optimist and the natural pessimists, but they have a chance to write down the way they prefer and they will balance each other out, leading to a deeper analysis of what's really going on. And when you've run out of things to write down, put all the notes on a wall and then take a step back. Try to spot some patterns in what you've come up with. Maybe some of the things are all related to one particular feature of a product, or maybe they represent a particular group of people that use the service that you provide. Move those notes that fit within that pattern into, a, into one area next to each other, no matter what color they are, so that they form a cluster. Once you've got this, the rose thorn bud analysis in front of you is much easier to pick apart a complicated set of interconnected issues. And if you've managed to form some clusters, you'll immediately be able to see visually where you need to focus your efforts to improve things, and also where the good things are that you don't want to lose. I've used this technique on medical projects for new diabetes treatments, olive oil processing plants, and one time even to help me and my family to plan a holiday that everyone would enjoy. Well, that's all from me. I hope this has given you a small introduction to human-centered design and encouraged you to think about why it might be something worth giving some time to. Thanks again for tuning in. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mark. That was a fantastic talk. Um, so we've got uh, our first question is from James. Uh, what sort of work does your company make? Okay, yeah, uh, a whole variety of things. We've worked on heads-up displays for Richard Browning from Gravity Industry, the guy who has developed his own jet engine, uh, jet suit, so that he can he can fly around. Um, uh, we've worked on or are working on non-invasive forms of diabetes treatment, um, working on um, augmented reality systems for people with Parkinson's, right through, so those are quite technical ones, right through to um, simple plastic components that are used as part of a baby food tool. So a, hu a huge variety, really. Oh. Uh, so we've got another one from Leo. Uh, are there more resources where we can learn about these techniques like the rosebud thorn? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there are a load of things. If you just Google human-centered design resources or techniques, uh, you'll find loads of things come up. I think there's one uh, by a company called IDEO. Um, I think it might be called Design Kit or something along those lines. Uh, yeah, quite a few companies have now made resources available online that you, so you can learn the basic techniques. The Design Council might also have some, some things like that. But yeah, there's t tons of stuff online you can learn. 